All right, well, thank you all for uh, joining. We are uh, kicking off today's Toolbox Tuesday with how to ACE compliance. Um, my name is Dan Martinez, one of the grant managers here at the uh, Illinois Works Pre-Apprenticeship Program. And um, I'm hopeful that um, uh, most of this information will be um, uh, old news to you, but uh, in case it's not, please feel free to ask questions as we go. You can put them in the chat. Uh, you can unmute yourself. Um, uh, but I'm sure there will be a couple uh, things that we'll be able to, a uh, couple pearls of wisdom we'll be able to impart everyone. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to be talking about the overall compliance process. So you have an understanding of what uh, the grant managers, uh, you know, do and see. Uh, we're going to share some ideas on, on tools that can help your organizations uh, with their verifications and uh, sharing some compliance tips, some things that we recommend that uh, all grantees do uh, to ensure uh, their compliance uh, performance is, is as high as it can be. We'll talk just very briefly about uh, grant renewal because of its importance, because of uh, how important compliance is to the grant renewal process, and uh, then just touch on some upcoming dates. So, you know, as we look at monthly compliance, this is uh, this is essentially the process that the Office of Illinois Works and, and the grant managers in particular follow, right? So, you know, first uh, we do a compliance data pull using the export report in IWRS. So we we uh, always announce that date. Um, you know, a lot of folks sometimes will ask us what time uh, we are going to um you know Im implement the um the compliance pull and uh, you know the unless we specifically state a time uh, and we usually don't um it's just considered to be you know midnight the night before so if if we had said september 10th well then you know midnight on september 9th anything after that september 10th is fair game for us to pull that data and uh, you'll see the importance of of that data pull in a little bit um, the next step is that we then verify the outcome metrics based on that data that's been entered into IWRS. So we actually use those export reports as um, the roadmap for us to then go into IWRS and verify the outcome metrics. Like that's one step, but that actually is what takes um, probably a 100 combined hours uh, each month for the Office of Illinois Work. So that is the that is the lion's share of the work there. Uh, so it's a little bit understated as uh, just a you know box number two. Uh, once we've done that, and once we're able to verify the metric, whether it's enrollment, completion, or one of the transition metrics, uh, we verify those outcomes in IWRS. So essentially, um, you know, every participant uh, has, you know, two statuses, right? They have the claimed status, and that's what your organization gets to enter as their overall status. So when you move an individual from an applicant to an, to enrolled, or when you move someone from enrolled to complete or complete and in transition, um, there's a status behind that that the grant managers then verify. Uh, so you have a status of enrolled as the overall IWRS status, and we have um, an enrollment verification status. So there's a, there's always a shadow one that's based on compliance. I'll show you that screen in uh, later on in the presentation. And then um, once we've done that, we're able to determine the compliance rating using the verified metrics and essentially the work plan, right? So every organization has a work plan that's um, you know designed to uh, state, okay, in cohort one, we're going to enroll this many people and we're gonna complete this many people and we're gonna transition this many people. And, um, and those are essentially the goals that you're held to as we verify individuals Right, so let's say the goal was 20 enrollments and we verify 10, the enrollment verification will be 50%. Um, and so the, the, again, those are based on the work plan and then what we verify. And then uh, the final step is then putting all that into reports that, that we can then share with each grantee. 
So starting with that first step, uh, we look at, you know, pulling the data out a month out of uh, compliance and or out of IWRS. And we're, we're kind of stressing this point because um, a lot of what I just had discussed in terms of the overall process flow, um, grantees can essentially perform the same tasks, right? You can do the same uh, things that uh, the grant managers do and identify whether or not someone's going to be uh, verified for their enrollment or their completion or their transition. So uh, that's why we're sharing all of this, of course, because um, except for that one step, which I'll highlight, um, all of these things grantees can do on their own as part of their data quality management. So again, it starts with exporting the data out of IWRS. And the, um, the most important thing to recognize here is that this is what essentially starts the process. So um, if you had a bunch of applicants come into an open house and it was great, it was incredibly successful. And, and you know, uh, again, you had a cohort of 20 uh, was your goal. And you had this fantastic over, uh, open house and you have 25 people that were very interested and interviewed and you offered them uh, enrollments. And you're all excited and you're processing all that and, and they come to their orientation the first day of training and your cohort kicks off with 25 people instead of 20. Um, and everything's going great. Well, until you move them from applicant to enrolled in IWRS, we can't begin the compliance process. So. Um, whatever status the individual is, um, when we pull compliance, that's the status we are going to use for the, the that month's uh, compliance. So if they're still in applicant status, we can't review them at all, right? Um, and it, so it follows that if, as the cohort ends, and once it's over, and you've had everyone graduate, if the individuals are still in an enrolled status, uh, two weeks later, when we pull compliance, we can't evaluate the, them for completion because they're still in the overall status of enrolled. So um, that's the that's the overwhelming importance of pulling this. And again, uh, this is everyone has access to this on that same partner recruitment and engagement screen. Uh, then we come to actually performing the um, the verifications. So for enrollment, you know, we uh, pull up a part uh, each participant, um, you know, we go to the intake tab and we follow through on all the things that are required, right? Um, was the pre-screening information uh, adequately filled out? Um, was the, is the application completed, right? Um, does the application include the information on eligibility, such as is the individual over 18? Are they an Illinois resident? Uh, the application will also have uh, their uh, highest um, highest level of education, uh, which will then we will confirm that they have at the very least their high school diploma, transcript, GED, um, you know, on the next step there. Uh, one of the things that's highlighted here is that we confirm their legal name. So um, uh, this is something that we've uh, tried to focus on this year uh, by ensuring that grantees understand the importance of entering the person's uh you know proper legal name right um you know i go by dan martinez but if i were uh you know a participant in one of your programs you would need to enter me into iwrs as daniel martinez and we'll see that in a moment because then also my first aid cpr card my osha 10 card and my other you know um uh certifications and credentials need to say Daniel Martinez, not Dan Martinez. So um, we're highlighting that. Um, and certainly it becomes challenging when, you know, uh, sometimes participants don't, um, you know, they, they go by one of their two last names or they maybe they go by a middle name, but that's, that's why it's important to, um, you know, capture a lot of their information. Um, generally you need a driver's license or a birth certificate or something to, uh, you know, identify them on the front end anyway. Uh, so it's it's something that makes sense to get right the first time in IWRS. Then, of course, we have uh, your staff's uh, interviewer names, right? We want to see the interviewer names and the average score from those two interviews. Uh, we further dive into that by actually pulling the interview sheets that you uploaded. 
uh, making sure that they are for the right participant. Sometimes, um, you know, we we have uh, a good looking interview sheet. It's just not uploaded into the right person's profile, right? So it has to be out in the right person's profile. Uh, we have to be able to see the names of those interviewers. Um, and then, of course, the scoring has to be uh, accurate and calculated correctly. So, um, you know, if we, we we double check all of those things, and then we, you have the two interview, two separate interviewers uh, that interviewed the participant at the same time, um, independently score. And so, if one comes up with a total score of thirty six, and the other comes up with a total score of thirty seven. We need that average, and so that's why the you know in this example you you might be able to see it, but it says thirty six point five, right? So we need the average of those two scores. Um, then we'll keep moving down the the intake list, and we'll take a look at the commitment agreement. Uh, we make sure it's signed and dated by both the participant and the staff member. Uh, we make sure that the commitment agreement has been properly filled out. There are there are spots in the commitment agreement where it asks you to uh, fill in for that particular cohort, what are the dates of the, uh, that the individual is going to be required to attend? You know, what are the hours? Are they, is it a morning session where they're coming in from, you know, 8 a.m. to noon, or is it an evening session where they're coming in from, you know, um, you know, 4 p.m. to 8 p.m.? Uh, whatever it is, it, all that information should be uh, on the commitment agreement so that, you um, you know, the participant knows what they're they're signing up for and agreeing to. Uh, we talk about proper cohort enrollment. So this is something that, um, you know, uh, sometimes uh, we have, you know, different challenges. Some grantees are operating um, in different locations, different cohorts. And so we wanna make sure that they're enrolled in the, in the proper location, um, you know, certainly, uh, understanding that, um, you know, it, it should really flow se sequentially, right? So if you had intended on doing a, a second cohort in a separate city at a satellite office, but then you didn't, um, typically you should work that out with your grant manager. And it's not just that you're going to then complete cohort one and cohort three. You might just do cohort one and cohort two, even though cohort two originally was going to be at the satellite. Now it's at, um, you know, the, your main location. The importance for that is when this information is looked at two years from now or eight years from now, um, it's not going to be obvious why you had a cohort one and a cohort three, but no cohort two. So um, typically those should be sequential as well. But again, work with your grant manager whenever you have something like that coming up. Um, the wraparound service assessment. Right, that uh, is supposed to happen at the orientation. Um, you know, for 2023, uh, the Office of Illinois Works uh, mandated that not only could you, but you needed to have an orientation um, that you included in your instructional hours. Right, and and we had up to four hours of instruction, and so that was so that um, those were stipendable hours, and you could require all of these things that need to be done for enrollment to be done, right? To ensure that um, the commitment agreement was signed, to ensure that the wraparound service assessment is um, is taken. And um, and then of course, next, the orientation career assessment, which is, you know, uh, filled out on paper individually by each participant and then uploaded um, uh, to IWRS by the uh, transition service coordinator or data entry coordinator. So all of those things are are meant to be done uh, within 24 business hours of your of the the first class of orientation. Um, and then uh, you know we put here of course that the overall status in IWS must be enrolled. So again, if they're still an applicant, for one thing, you can't do all of the things that you know are needed to be done, but. Um, Second of all, as I had already explained, we wouldn't be able to even start reviewing any of this for, um, you know, for their enrollment verification. Uh, I will say also, you know, I say that the overall status um, is enrolled. Uh, really, what that means is that at one time it had to have been enrolled. So, for example, um, you know, let's say 
I'm going to rewind the clock. Let's go back to June. And, um, you know, if, if the June compliance poll was on, uh, June 3rd and your cohort started, uh, June 10th, uh, obviously we wouldn't have seen anything, but of course your work plan didn't require anything. So there's no issue there. Uh, but your cohort starts June 10th. And by June 13th, someone has already dropped out. So you on June 11th, you had marked them as enrolled. And now on June 13th, they're dropping out of the program. Um, and so you move them to incomplete. So the next time we pull compliance, uh, we'll have gone from June 3rd to say July 5th. And that person during those compliance polls was never uh, in an enrolled in enrolled at the time of the compliance poll, but we will include incompletes there as well, because they, at one time they were enrolled. What we don't include are administrative withdrawals and um, not enrolled statuses, and of course, applicant or inquiries. So that was a lot of information about uh, enrollment verification. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Are there any questions in the chat or does anyone want to come off of mute and, uh, and ask anything? Dan, I want to be clear. Hi, this is Ashley. Hi. Hi. I uh, want to be clear. You did say for all of this process, it should be entered within the 24 hour time period of orientation or after orientation. So after orientation. Okay. So, you, you know, if you, if you hold your orientation on a Monday. You know, we, we'd expect that by the end of the day on Tuesday, this information uh, is, is, has all been entered into IWRS. Now, uh, keep in mind a couple of things. The vast majority of it, or I, I, at the very least half of this, should have been entered before the orientation, right? Your pre-screening information came in before you even interviewed the, the individual, and so did the application. Um, then you should have required a copy of their high school diploma or transcript, and that could have been uploaded. And then you interviewed the individual before you even offered them a spot of an enrollment into your uh, cohort. And so all of that information should have been in there. So by the time you get to, hey, we're starting this, let's see who actually showed up. We only have a commitment agreement to upload, a wraparound service assessment, to enter and an orientation career assessment to enter. Just those three things. And that's when you then uh, mark them as enrolled. And at the same time of marking them as enrolled, you select the cohort. So it's really just those final three things that you're doing before you can mark them as enrolled. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Uh, Dan, this is Gail. My question was, dealing with the applications where you uh, put male and female, and that's required, I understand that. But the next question is, she, he, I mean, I'm sorry, she, her, those act, those, um, how people want to be referred to. If the person doesn't want to be referred by any of that, I leave it blank, but that's an issue in your system, but there's no mandatory by that. Right, so the um, the sex at birth, I'm trying to go from memory. I don't actually fill out the application mm -hmm. ever. So I'm not 100% uh, familiar with um, uh, all of the choices, but I believe sex at birth is a required question, but yeah. one of the responses can be, um, you know, like prefer not to respond, right? Right. And, but... then, and then, you're, then you're talking about then the preferred pronoun Yes, preferred and, but that's not a required question. It is because if you don't put something, your information show us if you didn't answer male or female. I experienced that at the last run. Okay. The answers were in there when I went in, but I didn't answer that question due to, uh, and I didn't do all the interviewing, but we ask them if they want to use that. And if they say, no, we leave it blank in this, uh, this group, there were some who do not like using those pronouns. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll have to look at that. Um, so you, you, can you 
can you move forward in the application or will it won't say you can you can move forward in the application and i thought it was okay because it wasn't you know you have like the little red dot beside that we know that we have to complete that one so i didn't think it was a big deal but it is a big deal because i got flagged on those hmm. i have you didn't get flagged by iws you got flagged during compliance i got flagged by uh you guys mm-hmm mm -hmm. Compliance okay. on that, and I so see. when All I right. went that's in, what was confusing me. I thought, okay, that's what. There's two different definitions of required. One is required oh. by IWRS, <laughs> and one is required by. Uh, okay, that was. I was trying to think about IWRS and how that worked. Yeah. All right. So. Um, yeah. That well. That you know what that is something that comes on your uh, compliance report then, and this is. Um, this, this is a great point, right? We'll talk about this in a moment, but on okay. each compliance verification worksheet, there is a column that says needed for verification or something to that effect. If there's something, if there's a statement in there that does not make sense to you or you are having difficulty complying with, email your grant manager and explain the situation, right? So that's that's the cure all for all of those things. If they're saying, hey, you know, this needs to be entered, your response could be, um, you know, hi, grant manager, uh, for this participant uh, on August's compliance verification worksheet, you are stating that they must answer this question on the application. As you can see, the application has been completed. The person declined to uh, respond to that. And it's not a requirement on the application. Okay. Uh, okay. Move forward. All right. That's fine. And they might say, oh, my apologies. I didn't realize it was an optional question. Don't worry about it. Or they might say, IWRS is incorrect. It is a required question. You need to reach out to the person and get a response. Whatever it's going to be, but you, you need to have that conversation with the grant manager. All right. Anything else before I move on? Okay, so a question just popped up in the chat, Dan. If someone attended orientation, would that still count as incomplete or administrative withdrawal if they never attend any classes? So, um, uh, I'm, I'm not saying it will always be black and white, but uh, definitely use your grant grantee manual for definitions. Um, and I think, I think. The definitions are pretty clear on this. Administrative withdrawal is only for an individual that has never attended, not for one hour, not for one day, not for one week. They've never attended, right? Um, incomplete is someone who attended at least once. So if they showed up to your orientation and they filled out your commitment agreement and did the wraparound service and orientation career assessment, and then they decided not to come back the next day, they are incomplete. Administrative withdrawal is for someone who you offered a spot to who was eligible. They scored over 32 on their interview and they have a high school diploma and they're over 18 and all of that. You've offered them a spot, but they never showed up for orientation. Those are in, uh, that's an administrative withdrawal. There's nothing additional in the chat, Dan. All right. So then we move on to monthly can uh, to the um, uh, completion verification. So there are a couple of main sections. Um, first, we're going to start by just talking about the training uh, module because that's really you know probably the biggest uh, thing. And um, you know, first off, your training modules must match the approved curriculum. So your final curriculum form. Um, now, it's the responsibility of the Office of Illinois Works to uh, put those into IWRS, but it's the responsibility of the grantees to ensure that they're accurate. So, what I mean by that is, way back in 2022, there was a, um, uh, a, a training service called Instructional Service. It was kind of a, a legacy thing in Illinois WorkNet. Um, it is, it's not an approved training 
in uh, Illinois works. Um, and occasionally, again, because it's part of Illinois WorkNet, it appears in a um, in a grantee's training uh, set up for a particular particular person. So if you see um, instructional service in your uh, training modules, um, you can mark it as evaluated not required because it's not part of your training service, or you can let your grant manager know. Uh, but what you can't do is say, oh, we have, um, you know, a, an employability skills that we wanted to cover. Uh, we'll just stick it in there and we'll mark the hours for employability skills in this random instructional service training module. Like it, you, that can't be done. It, every training module must be named as uh, it was approved on your final curriculum form. And and um, and we need to make sure that you're not using ones that don't belong there. So then um, each of your training services must have uh, at least 80% attendance or above. Uh, some like OSHA 10 require 100% attendance. Uh, but again, to stress, I think this is known to everybody that is on a per training module basis, right? Not just overall 100% or 80% for the, for the, you know, 180 hours of your program. It's each training module must have that 80% attendance. And uh, likewise, each training uh, module must have a 70% or higher post assessment to be a successful completion, right? It's not an average of all the post assessments that they take. Um, it's each training module must have over 70% on the post assessment. Um, so all again, in order to have an overall uh, person be considered a graduate of uh, the program, each of their training services from that final curriculum form uh, must be successfully completed. So the status in IWS is successful completion. Um, there is an exception for evaluated not required, and that is for first aid CPR or OSHA 10. If the individual in your, if one of the individuals in your cohort or several individuals in your cohort, if they already have their OSHA 10, and they would like to not attend that class, um, they can provide you with their OSHA 10 uh, documentation. Uh, you can scan that and upload it into their IWRS profile, and you can mark them as evaluated, not required for that OSHA 10 training module. Um, the, they will not receive a stipend for those training hours, um, but they will be allowed to be considered successfully completed overall if everything else is in line. Um, the same holds true for first aid CPR, um, but first aid CPR typically has an expiration date, whereas OSHA 10 typically does not. Um, and the requirement as stated in the grantee manual is that um, the, uh, the documentation must show that they will be certified for one year after graduation at, at a minimum. So if, uh, you know, it, it might be May when they enroll and they say, I already have this, um, and it turns out their, their first aid, um, you know, uh, CPR expires in July of 2025. And it again, your, your cohort starts in May or June, but you don't end until August. Well, by graduation, there's only going to be 11 months left on that first aid CPR. They're going to need to retake it with their cohort. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then we say an earned credential entry for each credential successfully completed. So credentials are um, a digital representation of that first aid CPR card or that OSHA 10 document or their, their you know, M, uh, Trades Future MC3 graduation certificates, their NCCR core, their ICCB, right? So those earned credentials are entered into IWRS. And, um, we identify at the beginning of the grant year, typically actually during negotiation, what trainings you're uh, going to provide that require a certification slash credential. So uh, obviously the, the three I've been talking about, OSHA 10, first aid CPR, and then um, 
the MC3, NCCR core, or, or ICCB. Uh, but some organizations may also choose to add additional trainings that require a uh, certification, such as um, uh, forklift safety or uh, flagger um, or, um, or other hazards or, or safety training. So those can be, um, you know, if, if those are part of your final curriculum form, if those are things that uh, your organization, um, Illinois Works had agreed to that your organization is going to provide, then um, that document must be uploaded into IWRS and then the credential entered under the appropriate service as well. Um, and again, just so we're all clear, for NCCR core, the uh, proper training module for that to be entered under is module 109, right? Um, it may not be the last one that you're providing, but all uh, NCA, NCCR core credentials should be un entered under module 109. Um, and then <clears throat> as we look at the uh, image on the screen, we have, um, oh, I just talked about the credentials. Uh, we have training services, wraparound services, transition services, stipends are still lower, but um, you can see that most of them in the status column, the far right column say complete, right? So all of the services under each one of those um, goals must be in a final status. So successful completion, unsuccessful completion, or evaluated, not required. Um, and then each of the uh, overall goals should say complete. Um, Whereas uh, this is highlighting that the training service still says on track, so that would not be considered um, a final status, and that would need to be corrected. Uh, a couple more items with related uh, with regards to that: the uh, at least one transition service is always required for uh, uh, participants to be considered graduates, and um, in fact, the IWS has been updated to ensure that all um, participants are receiving um, uh, certain services based on their orientation career plan. So some of you that um, have enrolled individuals uh, recently should have seen that. Um, we talk about the wraparound service assessment during intake. So those automatically, when you take a wraparound service assessment, those will automatically trigger certain wraparound services if they have. Um, so if those were requested, uh, again, it's I IWRS's responsibility to automatically place them into the goal, but it's the grantee's responsibility responsibility to make sure that that happened. So in case that uh, IWRS makes a mistake and does not include childcare, even though the person requested it, then uh, the grantee would need to manually add that to the wraparound services. And then anytime there's an other services that are requested. So wraparound service assessment, uh, the final question is, are there any other services that you might need assistance with um, in order to complete the program or something to that effect? That will trigger an other wraparound service um, service to be entered into the to that goal. Um, there are uh, other student support services, something that doesn't fit into the, the tutoring, the uh, makeup sessions, the... Um, the makeup post assessment evaluation. Um, so there's an other student support services. When you have an other in one of your services, you need to make sure to enter a case note in that service. So I wanna make sure I'm clear on that. I'm not talking about the case note section. That's just a general case notes for that entire profile. When you click on one of those services, you can actually enter a case note that's attached to that service. So we want to know what was the other thing that was requested. Right? Even if it turns out you're going to mark it as evaluated, not required, that the person no longer needs it. Well, what was it that they initially needed? Um, we need you to define what that other is. Um, and then I mentioned that all goals should be in their final status. Uh, so we're going to still talk about completion, but since there's a lot on this page, is there anything, uh, any questions that anyone has on this? There are no questions in the chat. Okay. And I just realized that I'm uh, taking up way too much of your time on each one of these. So I'll try to move along a little bit faster. Um, 
Hold on just a second, Dan. Let's see. Juan just asked, would this work for someone who did not request gas cards, but then things changed or bus cards, either one? Yeah, so that's a good question. So again, you can manually add, um, you know, uh, you can manually add services to, you know, the goals. So even if they didn't request it during the wraparound service assessment, you can then manually add uh, say transportation assistance um, into the wraparound services goal. When you do that, um, you know, entering a case note explaining that, you know, why they originally didn't ask for it, uh, but now they're asking for it makes a lot of sense. But yes, you can certainly manually add things even if they didn't request it in the assessment. All right, um, other things that are required for uh, completion verification, uh, satisfaction survey participation, obviously that's not part of IWRS at all, um, but that is something that the grantee should be ensuring that their uh, participants uh, do and take advantage of. It is an anonymous survey, but at the very end, uh, the uh, individual filling it out can choose to um, request to be contacted by the Office of Illinois Works, and in that case, then they would they would put their contact information. Um, attendance rosters are properly uploaded to the cohort details. Um, you're actually going to be receiving an email this afternoon about attendance rosters. Uh, we are going to be having a guidance um, uh, update and discussion. Many of the uh, attendance rosters have not been uh, filled out as intended. Um, and so we're going to have a discussion about what is required going forward and how um, uh, grantees that have not Take an attendance according to the guidelines, how they can um, cure those those issues. Um, but that um, again, that's going to be a, a discussion for another time, but you'll re uh, your organizations will all be receiving emails on that this afternoon. Dan, before um, you move on, um, Roger did place a question in the chat and that's how do how do we, or how do the grantees access the survey results? So. Uh, we will be consolidating the survey results for each grantee um, uh, once their cohorts are finished, uh, once all cohorts are finished, I should say, and we'll share that with uh, grantees at that time. Okay, that's all for now. All right. That's a good question. Then, um, you know, stipend payments, stipends, as I mentioned, that goal was, we couldn't see it on the last screen, but um, here is a, a screenshot of what the dollar value of service looks like for the stipend service. Uh, the key thing to note, um, first of all, you know, stipends are required to be paid on a weekly or biweekly basis. So we want to see um, all of those entries in terms of the stipend date and, and when they were paid. Um, uh, we don't want to just see one single entry showing, you know, two thousand two hundred dollars um, and. It's also really important to, um, you know, to understand that we are looking for alignment on four different things. So we talked about the training modules and that 80% attendance requirement. And so all of the grantees are entering in attendance. So when we look at the attendance for an individual, you know, let's say they were supposed to, um, you know, uh, uh, be in, in the, uh, in the program for 200 hours, uh, but they only attended for 175 hours, right? And uh, let's say your program pays stipends at a $10 an hour rate, right? So we would expect to see payments of $1,750. That means the stipends and the attendance that's entered into IWS would be in alignment. Um, but we just talked about attendance rosters being uploaded. So we'd expect to be able to download those rosters and and identify where those 175 hours are. Um, and so that the rosters then need to be in alignment. And then finally, your organizations all submit uh, PFRs. Those are periodic financial reports in which you request reimbursements for the stipends that you've paid. That's that re, uh, reimbursement request must match exactly what you have entered here for stipend payments. 
So all four of those things must match in order uh, for us to um, properly close out a grant. So Dan, Daisy has two really good questions before you move on. Um, so the first is, if stipends are expected to be paid weekly or biweekly, what happens if a stipend payment falls between modular dates? Well, it, you know, certainly it's going to depend on your, your process. Um, you know, if, if there's a week off due to, you know, the 4th of July, you might not be able to move that in there. It, it, you know, we're talking about the general policy, not the, well, you know, there's a holiday and, and we can't get that stipend payment in 14 days. It needs to be 18 days or something like that. Um, or, or you're waiting for a module to to wrap up, depending on how you're you know you're doing your your um, your your stipend policy. You know, some are just basing it on the weeks. It doesn't matter if the modules have finished. Some are waiting for a module to end so that they can uh, verify the performance element of it. Because again, these are not just hourly payments, right? Are this is not a wage. They all have a performance element, and so so that's understandable. Um, but uh, you know, so there's. There's a, some wiggle room there, but that also has to be part of your stipend policy. I have a question. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Gail Newcomb again with Women Innovation Group. You made a point about performance. So I have, unfortunately, this cohort, two students who are not performing. Um, and they have not passed some tests. And we are giving them tutoring. They are you know, going through all that with a stipend, their performance don't show that they're supposed to get a stipend, I would assume. I, am I wrong for that? Well, it would depend on what your stipend policy says. So all, all participants are required to have received a stipend policy from their, uh, you know, from the grantee at the, um, you know, at the beginning of the program. So, um, your stipend policy should outline, you know, what's required. Um, typically, uh, you know, stipend policies would, um, would explain that it can be reduced for something like that, but not eliminated. Um, they typically, you know, they, they cannot receive stipends for tutoring hours. Um, so, you know, the, the, it's not like they can make up, um, any reductions, uh, but that's something that you need to look at your stipend policy and have, you know, kind of a, a discussion with your grant manager as to how exactly that's that can be managed. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Dan, I think that's probably the same answer to, uh, well, we're going to go back in a second to Daisy's second question, but uh, in the meantime, as you were uh, speaking about the stipends falling between training modulars, Daisy would like some additional clarification on specifically how this weekly stipend process works with the modulars and performance aspect. But like I said, I think your answer as far as what does your agency's individual policy stipend payment um, policy allow for would be the first place to start. But if there's anything additional you'd like to add, please do. No, yeah, and I would, you know, the, um, the grantee manual has um, a, you know, a sample stipend policy, um, and a, um, I can't remember how it's phrased. Like there's a, st a sample stipend policy and a, uh, a sample uh, stipend letter. I think, um, I think those both are in the, uh, in the grantee manual in the back. So I, I would also look at that at those. And then, you know, this is something that the, you know, the. The wraparound service uh, community of practice, you might, you know, discuss with your, uh, you know, uh, colleagues, uh, throw out an open question to them. How are you handling stipends? How are you, uh, how much do you reduce for, you know, um, uh, you know, test retakes, things like that. Share this information among one another. It's a, it's a great way to get an understanding of what other programs are doing and what might work for yours. All right. Um, uh, don't go away so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> they just keep coming. Well, you know what? I might have been overly enthusiastic about um, answering questions during this. Why don't we run through um, the rest of the presentation 
and we that way we can get through it and we'll I'll stick around and answer questions for as long as people want to um to ask them afterwards. That's an excellent plan. In that case, guys, keep those questions coming. Yep. So definitely don't you know put them in the chat so you don't forget them and, and we'll address them uh as we get done. Um okay, hold on one moment. I have to uh Reauthenticate just a moment. Okay. Thank you all so much for your questions. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, a couple other items that are required for completion verification. The um, pre transition career assessment um, must be completed. So we see that up. Um, in the first image, uh, it, it goes on the intake page. It's the exact same questions as the orientation career assessment. Uh, the transition service coordinator, though, instead of um, you know having the individuals fill it out on their own on paper, the transition service coordinator should be sitting down one on one with each participant um, and having a discussion and really framing the the, the final steps of uh, their transition plan. So understanding, you know, what, where they're wanting to go and what the steps are that need to do that. Um, so that's an incredibly important part of it. And so that's why it's part of the uh, completion verification. Uh, we also look at uh, making sure that those documents are uploaded. So that's the second image there. There's our upload um, uh, page. And certainly every program is required to upload the individual's, you know, proof of first aid CPR certification, uh, their OSHA 10 uh, certification, and then that third item, whether it's an ICCB certification, um, Trades Future MC3, or uh, the NCCR core um, certif certificate or transcript. And then, of course, it goes back to the overall status must be complete or complete and in transition. Uh, here again, I will point to the definitions in, I, uh, in the grantee manual, because there is a lot of confusion, it seems to be about that. Uh, complete is a temporary status that almost no one should ever go into. Complete means that they graduated, but have not received any transition support, right? So we just talked about that pre-transition career assessment. Um, they're required to have that, and that's when the transition service coordinator must begin providing them with transition support if they have not already throughout the entire program, which they really should have. Um, complete and in transition means they've fulfilled all the uh, other aspects and they're receiving transition support or they have received transition support. It does not mean that a transition document has been uploaded. That's not part of the definition. All right. Um, I think I got off of this. There we go. Okay. And then real quickly on transition verification, uh, this information is all in the grantee manual, so I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but certainly, um, you know, we review uh, whether there's been a transition document that's been uploaded, whether it's a, a primary preliminary or a primary final. Primary preliminary simply means that a person has applied to a registered apprenticeship program. A um, couple of note, items to note, it must have the participant's name. It must have the name of the registered apprenticeship program. It obviously must be a third party document, right? It has to come from the registered apprenticeship program. Uh, it must also show uh, completion of the application. We get a lot of um, uh, documents that say, uh, you know, thank you for uh, registering, you know, please come in on September 15th to complete your application. Well, that's not a primary preliminary transition document, right? That's showing that they've started the process. They have not finished it. Um, the final primary transition shows acceptance into enrollment into that registered apprenticeship program. And um, uh, one item to note there in the bottom left hand corner that um, again, this is a focus for 2024. If a primary transition document has been uploaded, then the transition service of assistance with completing an apprenticeship program application 
must be added to the transition service goal and it must be marked as successful application. Regardless of whether or not you drove the person there or you even told them about it, it was part of your program's assistance with them preparing for uh, that application and developing their resume and having everything ready to go, the interview skills, those employability skills, the Office of Illinois Works considers you to be an integral part of that, even if that particular apprenticeship program, they filled out on their own and didn't even ask you for the $25 to pay for it. Um, it's still part of your service. And if they've provided that back to you, that document needs to be uploaded and that service needs to be entered. All right. Um, the same holds true for secondary and alternate uh, alternative construction transition documents um, with the exception there that um, we do have exhibit 18, the employment verification form in the in the grantee manual. All right, so I promised a peek into the um, that shadow portion where for every enrollment, there would be an enrollment verification from the from the office of Illinois works. So this is what that looks like. It's a you know, fairly simple screen, but once we're done with the monthly verifications, we can then mark whether a person has been uh, verified for enrollment, for completion, for any of the transition statuses, um, and, and then that stays in that participant's profile. So it is important to note um, with regard to transitions that transition documents are only reviewed at the time of completion verification. So what does that mean? Well, that means that if we verified that your individual that want, you know, Sam Smith completed in June and we awarded completion verification credit and um, 10 days ago, they provided uh, proof of enrollment into a registered apprenticeship program and you diligently uploaded that to IWRS as, like you were supposed to, that's great. But we're not gonna be notified of that unless you notify us that, hey, during September's compliance, can you look at Sam Smith's um, transition document? And then we will. So that's really important. Um, unless we're notified that those transition documents are there, we're not going to we're not going to see them once they've um, once the completion has been verified. All right, and then um, you know the work plan. I, I mentioned that uh, we develop your outcome metrics, so those uh, compliance ratings based on the work plans. So um, these are uh, really when your organization has uh, said and, and the Office of Illinois Works has approved for your cohort to start and your cohort to end. And it's based on that we determine whether or not to include those goals into your overall compliance rating. So that work plan is extremely important. We've been stressing this, I think, in almost every webinar that we've had all year. If your dates need to change, you must request approval, pre-approval from the Office of Illinois Works, right? We may say yes with no hesitation. We may say yes to part of it or make a recommendation on the change, or we may say no. But either way, it has to happen in advance. And um, and those work plans have to be kept current uh, because that's what your uh, performance rating is depending on. Uh, so here's how we calculate uh, performance rating. This is just looking at enrollment and completion. Trans transition is the same thing. It's just more complicated because because there's primary, preliminary, primary, final, uh, alternative constructions, and on and on. So it's it's too lengthy. So we just are looking at um, enrollment and completion. And um, again, when you see goal, that's coming from the work plan. So um, for cohort one, there's a goal of 20 uh, enrollments and a goal of 17 completions. Now, um, you'll notice for cohort two, uh, there's information for enrollment, but not for completion. Why is that? Well, because in this hypothetical example, um, the cohort hasn't ended at the date of the compliance poll. So there's nothing for us to evaluate there. And uh, we look at these as you know individual metrics. So cohort one enrollment is one metric. Cohort one completion is a second metric. And cohort two enrollment is a third metric, right? So 
in the um, bottom right hand corner of that uh, table, you'll see 261% divided by three, right? Those are those three metrics. Um, and here you wind up with a, a result of 87%. Uh, if cohort two had finished before the uh, compliance poll, then we would be evaluating four metrics, right? And then of course, transition um, would be a metric for each, each one of the cohorts as well. All right, so here's a really quick question. Um, based on the program dates below, which metrics would be taken into consideration during this compliance review? Um, so uh, just go ahead and take a look at that real quick, kind of answer it to yourself in your head. Uh, I'll give you about five seconds and then I'm gonna go ahead and put up the answer. All right, so we're looking at cohort one enrollment completion and transition. And uh, the reason why is we're pulling compliance on July 7th. And um, remember transition gets evaluated two weeks after the program end date. So that would have uh, been at the latest June 1st. And since we're pulling compliance on July, in July, that means for cohort one, we're looking at enrollment completion and transition. Whereas with cohort two, uh, it wouldn't have even started by July 7th, so we're not taking that into consideration. All right, here's a second question. Uh, based on these dates now, which of the metrics would be taken into consideration for this compliance review? All right, <clears throat> so in this case, we're looking at uh, cohort one, uh, enrollment, completion and transition, and uh, cohort two enrollment, right? Because that cohort two now in this case did start uh, before the compliance poll. It started in June 15th, whereas the compliance poll was July 7th. So again, these are critically important because these are uh, the, you know, the factors that determine your overall compliance rating, right? So here's an example compliance report. Um, it, it includes right at the top there an overall compliance rating, and, and that's how it's determined. Um, the important thing to note on this um, page or this uh, report is that all the overall compliance rating is essentially cumulative for your entire uh, grant year. Um, the items in the table below it are what you have uh, been, what we verified since the last compliance review. So um, that is not an aggregate. We do have an aggregate report that we provide you, and that is the payment worksheet. So here we break down on a monthly basis uh, how many individuals we verified for enrollment, completion, and transition, and we total those up. So that is um, a running total and an aggregate for your, uh, your program, and it includes the funding, um, uh, reimbursement eligibility per participant for each of those metrics. So one thing I should point out, you know, um, this payment worksheet will show you exactly how many individuals uh, we are uh, verifying for say enrollment. The verification worksheet will then show those, you know, individuals. So in this case, you would have had a, verif uh, a payment worksheet that said seven for July, right? And if you go to the verification worksheet, you will see exactly which seven uh, individuals we verified. So it, um, they really are, um, you know, uh, directly linked documents. So when we talk about the verification worksheets, and again, we already had um, those that needed for, for verification, um, you know, column, it's critically important that those things are addressed uh, each time you receive a verification worksheet. And again, if there's something in there that you believe um, that you can't do, um, so let's pretend you receive this uh, verification spreadsheet and it says the interview score is calculated incorrectly and you go back and you say, no, I've, I've done it three times and I used a calculator, uh, we calculated it correctly. 
Well, send your grant manager a note saying, um, you know, I looked at David Egg's uh, interview sheets. In fact, they're attached to this. Um, we're calculating this to be 38. Um, what are you seeing differently? And the grant manager might say, I have no idea what I was seeing differently. You're right. This is correct. You can ignore that and we'll verify it on the next compliance. Or they may point out to you what they were seeing. Maybe it was an illegible number or something. But the point is that it neither, either needs to be fixed or a direct message sent to your grant manager. They cannot just be ignored. All right. Um, so very quickly, I'm going to recap some of the tools that we recommend. You can use the export report. Um, you can uh, identify a lot of information just from the export report. The things that we talked about that we look at in IWS, a lot of these things are actually listed on that export report. Um, this presentation will be on our partner guide, by the way. So um, you don't have to write all these down or, or take a screenshot of this. We will be posting this shortly. Um, that monthly verification worksheet, as I said, either immediately fix what needs to be fixed or send your grant manager a message, but do not ignore it. Um, each one of those items, uh, not only is it important for your compliance score, but they are directly tied to your reimbursement eligibility and how your, your organization is funded. Uh, in the grantee manual, uh, we have a data verification checklist. You should certainly uh, utilize that. Uh, we have a participant file checklist. This you know, um, covers a lot of the things that you should have in your paper file um, and or IWRS. So if you're following all of these things, then you'll have all of the information and all the, um, the, the documents that IWRS requires and, and we require as part of compliance verification. All right, so this is the last part. Um, compliance tips, make sure those work plans are always up to date. Okay, I cannot stress that enough. Um, it is an absolute requirement for your organization to do that. Even if you don't care, say, ah, oh, well, our compliance will be low this month. We'll figure it out next month. No, those work plans are required to be approved by the Office of Illinois Works. They are part of the scope of, of your grant agreement. So um, make sure that, that those are up to date and you're working with your grant manager. Um, prior to compliance pull, Double check your participant status. You know, I've had grantees come to me and, and the, the program administrator says, I don't understand. How can we not have anyone uh, in an enrolled uh, enrollment verification? I have 20 people sitting in the classroom in the other room. And I said, well, they're all still in an applicant status in IWRS. I mean, we, we can't move forward until you do that data entry side, right? So it has to be reflected in IWRS. And, when time of, uh, is of the essence, and this time of the year it is, because I'm going to talk about renewal in just a second, um, fix things person by person. So make sure everything on one person's uh, profile is complete. Don't go through and upload everyone's diploma and then everyone's commitment agreement. Get it done person by person when time is of the essence. Uh, we've said all year. Every uh, grantee must have a data management plan, so make sure that that is being followed. And uh, when in doubt, contact your grant manager directly. And I know a lot of you are working with um, with Norman Ruano. He is our deputy director. He is also functioning as a grant manager. So I know typically you wouldn't just email him a simple question as the deputy director, but um, that who you, that is who your grant manager is at this time. So you need to be in communication with him. And of course, uh, you know, Monica and I, uh, as always, um, you know, will are there to assist our grantees. So for renewal, um, and your program administrators have already seen this, um, your overall compliance rating must be at 60% or higher to even be considered um, in September and October and or October. So um, organizations can be offered a conditional renewal if they get to at least 60% um, to 75%. Um, but 
uh, really what we want to see is organizations above that in the 70 per six, 76% plus range. And, um, and again, a lot of you will be receiving your September, um, uh, you know, compliance reports and you'll see right away you're in one of those categories and you'll be offered, um, or you should expect to receive a renewal offer. Um, but if you're below that, uh, you will not, and you'll have until October's compliance to rectify that. So looking at um, October's compliance, that is scheduled for October 4th. Uh, we just pulled compliance yesterday for September's. And again, that's gonna be the first uh, opportunity to be offered renewal for those of you that can be. Um, and then October 4th, it will be the second. Uh, for those organizations that have already been in the program for three years and are going through the NOFO process, um, your overall compliance rating is, will also be part of the um, merit reviewers evaluation. So it's important to um, to in, in make sure that those are uh, in those renewal thresholds as well. All right, so hopefully everyone is is ready to ace compliance. I'm sure there are a lot of questions before we do the questions. I am going to turn this over to. Um, uh, to Carlita to uh, uh, engage you with Mentimeter for your evaluation, and then I will stick around and we will. Um, we will answer any questions. So I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. Okay, thank you, Damon. And for those of you who are accessing Mentimeter, that code has been dropped into the chat area. And then we'll begin shortly. Give you guys a few minutes, or not a few minutes, but a few seconds to get into Mentimeter. Okay, so let's take a look at the first question. Please share your views on this training by rating the following statements from 1 being the lowest to 10 being the highest. To what extent did it meet your expectations? How likely you are to attend a similar event in the future and how likely you are to recommend this training to others? Thank you for those hearts. And are there any others? There we go. I see some more people joining us. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to move on. Oh, we have a few more people. Go ahead. <laughs> Next question. The course was relevant to what I had wanted to learn about this subject matter. Now, these will shift as you answer, but go ahead and select your answer. Strongly agrees, very strongly agree. Very good. Thank you so much. Next question is, I plan to apply what I learned. Strongly agree again. Very good. Somewhat disagree, strongly disagree. Okay. It's okay. Maybe this is something you're already familiar with. What improvements might you recommend? We'll take a minute or two to kind of answer this question. These are kind of helpful for us to know what we're doing, how we can improve what we're doing. Our first response is more time for the presentation. Presentation was great. Thank you. Are there any other responses? Okay, we're going to move. Here we go. Provide a spreadsheet listing all things being evaluated for reference. Really appreciated taking the time to talk about the data entry side of IWRS and the screenshots. Presentation was really fantastic. I would recommend we have this type of training in the beginning of the grant. Maybe do a step by step presentation like a video instead of a slideshow or work through on examples. I think it would be helpful. It would help new organizations if you go over this earlier and then real life examples and solutions. These are all great suggestions. Thank you so much. What did you find effective? If we make changes, what would you recommend we keep? 
And I'll give you another minute or so to collect your ideas and jot them down. Okay, our first response is to provide grantees earlier in the process. Awesome presentation. Thank you. Each slide showed exactly where to go and enter information. Good. The screen snippet helped. Going over in detail was helpful to me. Very good. These are wonderful recommendations to save as they do provide you guys with the information that we hope that you're able to use. And then the last one we have is give us information earlier in the process. I'm getting to hear a theme here. All good. Can't wait for the new updates. Are there any others? Okay, let's move on. Is there anything else about this course you think we should know? Nope. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> well, that says we've covered a lot of ground. More clarity on the stipend approval process. Okay, very good recommendation. Are there any others? Okay, thank you all for participating and sharing your ideas. We appreciate your feedback and I will hand it back over to Dan so he can answer some of your questions in the chat. All right. Thank you, Curly. I didn't think, uh, thank you to everyone who has uh, decided to stick around and, and have a little bit of discussion. So um, not sure where we may have left off. Um, with regard to the questions, I think, uh, So, Dan, if you don't mind, <laughs> go ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was going to uh, suggest that the majority of the questions came from one organization from Hasea. So, I didn't know if perhaps it'd be easier for them to unmute and simply ask their questions live. But then that was just a suggestion. So, <laughs> go ahead, <laughs> however you choose. All right, excellent. Yeah. Uh, it, whoever, um, I think it was Daisy, had a lot of yeah. uh, questions. Do you have any anything specific that wasn't covered? Hold on, we're trying to she, we're trying to unmute, but I can just follow up on her question about the stipends. Would be like uh, she asked if we're allowed to increase the stipend following the following week if makeups are done. If we're paying, if we have to pay like hourly for stipend, and how is that recorded on IWRS? So, um, I'll answer the the second part is, um, you know, stipends, uh, well, overall, right, what is your stipend policy? Like, that would be my first question. And, and those, th you know, things should be guided and answered uh, within your, your stipend policy. Most organizations wouldn't do a makeup payment, right? I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. just flows. It's just like. You know, uh, you know, I, I hesitate to uh, uh, compare it to to work, but you know, typically it just goes into your next paycheck, right? It's not like a, a special check would be cut. Um, but uh, with regard to can makeup sessions, um, you know, be paid, so that is discussed in the grantee manual. Um, they, it's up to each grantee to determine how they're going to handle that. Um, uh, initially, I think in 2022, they were, it was recommended that 
they were not uh, stipendable hours. But, um, you know, if an if a individual misses an entire class, you know, let's say a 12 hour uh, power tools class, and they make all of that up with your organization at a separate time, um, you know, most organizations would, um, in their stipend policy, allow for that, maybe at a reduced rate, you know, I don't know, is it 80 percent, whatever it's going to be. But again, that's the importance of the stipend policy um, to to have all that outlined. Then I, we did, this is Gail from Women Innovation Group. We did outline that um, our first cohort, because we're in cohort two, people really came to class and it was extreme emergencies and we paid 100%. It was a young lady that was in a car accident. That was no fault of her own and she made up everything. And so we paid her uh, the stipend in full because, you know, she immediately... I don't even know how she did it, contacted us by texting me, letting me know that she has the police report, she's at a accident and she had to take her kids to the hospital. So, you know, for someone like that, we paid 100%. For someone who just literally honestly told me, I overslept in text, I'll be there when I can. No. Yeah, we but again, well, I, I just wanna be clear. So. So you paid 100% of her uh, makeup hours. Yes, when she made them up. All right. She got so 100% of if, her makeup hours. I mean, hours. If, you, if your stipend policy was to not yeah, pay that, see. and that's the typical for people that oversleep, but then you you know grant an exception for somebody in an extreme emergency, right. and that's, that's kind of a different story. Yeah. So okay. but if somebody just missed and they have no excuse other than I'm oversleeping, no. <laughs> mm -hmm. But it's important to have that as a policy, and, and that's why the mm -hmm. guarantee manual states, uh, you know, all... All the um, uh, you know participants should receive that so that they know going in what you know. A lot of them are relying on that stipend payment, and uh, and and it helps for them to know you know what the what the um, you know what the rules are. All right, yeah. so let's see. We had an, a question in here from Isaiah: Is marking makeup hours as a support service satisfactory in regards to compliance? So, um, certainly makeup hours are a student support service. So if you're checking that box, when you're entering attendance and saying, yes, some of these are, you know, makeup hours, then, uh, for again, power tools, then you should also go into the student support services goal and add, uh, you know, a makeup hours as a service and, you know, market as successful completion and explain, you know, the the person put in, you know, 10 hours of power tools makeup. Uh, so hopefully that answered your question, Isaiah. And uh, then we have Scott. Um, by eliminating, we eliminate this by outlining at orientation, we put in our stipend procedure, no stipend for makeup. There you go. Right. Like it, it's whatever your organization is choosing to do, but it just needs to be consistent and outlined for those uh, participants. Um, great. I'm glad that worked out, Isaiah. Thank you. Any other questions? I, think that, I guess a lot of it was on that stipend. Um, I'm glad we had a good discussion on that. I don't see anything additional uh, in the chat. Dan, I will make mention though, and, and maybe you remember better than me, uh, there were several comments about, you know, receiving this information earlier and, and that type of a thing. Um, I've been here since January and I know that I have sat through a very, very similar presentation. So um, on our partner guide, I suspect that uh, there is this recording from earlier this year because uh, we have done this presentation before and much earlier, uh, but I'm glad that we were able to do it again. Yeah, absolutely. I get, that's, that's fair to point out for sure that most of this um, it, it was definitely part of the onboarding. Um, and then uh, these are all things that we presented to last year's grantees last year. And um, a lot of it was also discussed during the, um, uh, the IWRS update or the uh, grantee manual update with uh, returning grantees. So I'm gonna share something. I, you know, me being new, I don't remember this, but if I got it too early, 
it would just been like blah, 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 not knowing what the heck you're saying. But if this was given maybe once the first cohort started, I think it would be a great help to new organizations. At least that's my opinion. Because it because you're learning that system and it's not the easiest system to learn. Even with the we have went back and forth on things in the book and in the videos, this would be a help. I will say that. I think it would be a big help. Yeah. It's when it's done. Gail, I appreciate the thought. Um, Daisy had, had shared it as well. It's important to you know have this information as new staff you know comes on board. Um, so uh, both of you, I I, I agree hundred um, percent. This exact presentation was delivered, I think, in June or July of last year, and is on the partner guide. And one of the things we've we've you know shared with grantees. Um, is that all of these things, you know, they can go back and, and view these trainings as they need them, right? So, obviously, it's challenging for us to know when you need it, for you to know that what you need is available, but it's definitely worthwhile to know that um, all of these things are on the partner guide. And so, um, you know, whenever you do have new staff come on board or if you are you are at a particular stage where you know you're struggling, um, ask your grant grant uh, manager, hey, what videos do you recommend I look at on the partner guide or just go through the partner guide on your own? Um, and and um, yeah, then it'll be a little bit more timely. Yeah, because social, I, I didn't fill out something correctly just by listening to this today. I need to go back in. I already know. <laughs> I already know. Uh, we did something. See, when we did all of our um, makeups i i i didn't note them i don't think they were all noted in that area so they need to be noted in that area unless oh, I, I, sure. yeah i'll check with my team she could have did it or uh or uh, michael could have did it I, i'm gonna have to check with them i know i didn't do it <laughs> i know i didn't do it so i need to go back in there but i think it's something missing then Yep. Even if you guys don't catch it, I want it in there. So. <laughs> well, good. I'm glad it was helpful in that respect. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, I'm out of here. I got to get back and do some work. So thank you so <laughs> much. And Scott. Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Scott has put in a note that it does make the grant manager's job easier when things are done right the first time. You definitely uh, lucked out. Uh, by having a good grant manager there. Um, and Daisy, um, you know, I, I feel like your comments, you've kind of come back, um, back and forth uh, with um, uh, looking for things to be a little bit different. Uh, if you, you know, want to discuss this uh, directly with your grant manager, I, I certainly suggest you do. And, um, and you know, you, you have a point, uh, this particular presentation, was updated to include stipends, so that was not on the 2024, but it was on the February of 2024, um, uh, you know, update uh, presentation. So uh, most of that is in there. You know, we're not perfect. It's not always going to be, but uh, I think if if uh, you're unhappy with it, you should definitely reach out to your grant manager. So everyone, thank you for your time, and uh, we look forward to talking to you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye.